Welcome to the 2021. Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, I hope you all had a restful break and were able to, even though it is a, a unique uh, situation that we are in, I think uh, uh, we have all uh, become very resilient to change and we have been agile and been able to move forward with a lot of um, positivity and uh, of, happy, of happiness. I won't use the word positivity from the point of view of the virus, but <laughs> virus. But um, uh, the classes, uh, some of the classes are on campus now. Some of you are coming back on campus. So um, uh, we are delighted that you are back there. Uh, faculty have, uh, have, have, have been uh, modifying their co coursework to uh, accommodate all the different modes of teaching. Um, and uh, hopefully things are going to be smooth and this is the first of uh, early weeks of the classes and uh, hopefully everything will be smooth. I am delighted that after uh, we had a fantastic seminar series in the fall and uh, we are starting out with a bang with Dr. Vanessa Tolosa to, uh, uh, heading this, uh, this um, seminar series this semester. Uh, uh, she had hoped that she would be here on campus but uh, this is the way it is. And so we hope that she will come back. But first, let me tell you that Dr. Vanessa Tolosa in 2019 was selected by the Wiseman Group out of a whole group of worldwide nominations as one of eight finalists for the Multiplier of the Year Award. She was uh, labeled what is called a liberator, one who creates a climate that both invites and demands people's best thinking. What a wonderful person for us to have start the year for us, the, the 2021, demanding people's best thinking. And uh, as you have already probably already seen from her uh, short bio, she was uh, the director and basically shaped the first team at Neuralink. Everybody knows Elon Musk, if not through Tesla, then you know from Neuralink. And, amazing things that they have, were able to achieve with that. I'm sure she's gonna talk about what she has done there, but it talk, but what I, I, what I want to say is that she has had a career already in which she has been able to bring teams of multiple groups of people together to work on impossible dreams. And you know how President Rosenberg has always talked about us at FIU to be worlds ahead and, and to make the impossible possible. And she is, has done that and has led teams to, uh, to, do, to do that. Uh, she's also very committed to helping uh, uh, students from different diverse backgrounds to move forward. She has done things like um, uh, science sub, subreddit uh, platforms for the Bay Area Science Festival. She has done Google Hangouts with high school students and, and, and inspired girls to pursue math and science. So there's a whole another part, another aspect of Dr. Tolosa that is beyond science. Um, uh, you will see that she got her bachelor's at University of Florida. She's a Florida girl originally. Mm -hmm. And then of course she was um, at also at Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Those of you who may know more about the National Lab, she uh, started as a researcher, but ended up basically leading the whole effort for uh, multiple implantable mm -hmm. systems that especially funded through DARPA across what we think of really futuristic ways of neural implants. So with that, I'm going to stop and I'm going to say, I have had the privilege of knowing Dr. Tolosa. I think I first met her through one of those DARPA calls and, and one of the programs of, of researchers together. And it has been a fantastic uh, um, uh, opportunity to know her over the years. And uh, she is now uh, moved uh, started her own uh, her own uh, co um, uh, company or think tank thing, and she's sitting on multiple boards of new companies, and she's moving things out of the lab, helping people move things out of the lab into the commercial space or into really the futuristic commercial space. So, uh, Dr. Tolosa, welcome. Thanks so much for that welcome. So, let's make sure I've got my screen going. And good morning to everyone. I'm um, very happy to be here. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a Florida native. So anytime I get to speak to a Florida audience, especially students, it's a real treat for me. I, you know, I wish I could be in person, but maybe next time. 
And uh, today I'll be talking about my experience developing neurotechnologies. Uh, a lot of my time has been spent specifically working on how to make implantable devices smaller and reliable. I, I got most of this experience from working at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, where I did start from grad school, start as a postdoc, and spent about seven years there, and then three years at uh, Neuralink. And currently, uh, as mentioned, I'm working as a consultant for different research groups and startups who are developing neural implants. And I'm excited to talk to you about uh, one specific aspect, which is making these neural implants smaller and why we want to do that. My goal today is that by the end of this talk, you'll learn at least, at least one thing new about neural implants. I know many of you already know about this field and also understand why there is this trend toward making them smaller and smaller. And first I'll give a brief introduction to commercial neural prostheses, discuss why we want to miniaturize neural implants and one way this can be done. And in the end, I'll touch on some problems that uh, you guys will get to work on if you decide to get into this field of neural engineering. It's actually more than 99 problems. So one type of neural implant is a neural prosthesis. Uh, a neural prosthesis is a device that restores function um, lost as a result of neural damage. And neural prostheses have uh, FDA, uh, have been FDA approved since the 80s and 90s and have been implanted in hundreds of thousands of people. So some of you may uh, know people that have these and, and not even realize it. So all of the devices shown in this uh, slide here I work on the same basic principle, and that is electrically stimulating nerves or neurons. The main difference really is where you implant them and the function that they restore. So you have a cochlear implant for hearing to, to restore hearing, spinal cord stimulation, mainly for pain, and a deep brain stimulation device for movement disorders. So let's take a closer look at one of these devices. So how does a cochlear implant work? And we'll go from, from left to right here. You have uh, the external components and then the implanted device with the electrodes here in the cochlea that sit uh, with the auditory nerves just outside. So uh, sounds are first picked up by the microphone. The signal is then translated into a specific pattern of elect electrical pulses. These pulses are sent to the coil and they're then transmitted uh, wirelessly across the skin to the implant. The implant uh, sends a pattern of electrical pulses to the electrodes that are in the cochlea and the auditory nerve picks up these electrical pulses and sends them to the brain. The brain recognizes these signals as sound. A cochlear implant bypasses the normal sound conduction mechanism through um, the external middle and inner ear. And instead, so if these are damaged, uh, the implant can bypass this and directly stimulate the, the auditory nerve through the cochlea. And this is one example uh, of how, uh, or one, of one type of neural implant. It bypasses damaged biology and gets closer to that processing, processing unit that is our brain. If we were to zoom in on the specifically the electrode part of the neural implant, you know that neurons communicate with each other through electrical and chemical signals. With these implants, we take advantage of those electrical signals and we use electrodes to stimulate the neurons or record these, these electrical signals. The smaller the electrode, the smaller you can make them, then the closer you can get to the neuron and the better you can target a specific brain location. And this is important because different parts of the brain play different roles. So depending on where you're able to put, place your electrodes and stimulate, you can get a different response. So in the case of the cochlear implant, um, there's cartilage between the electrode and the auditory nerve. And whereas in DBS, you have the electrodes that are directly in brain tissue, like what's depicted in this image. So if we zoom out again on the device, we can see that all electrode-based neural implants have the same three basic components. You have the electronics package shown here that houses the 
electronics and battery in this case, and it's in a hermetically sealed package because you're, this is getting fully implanted and you need to protect it from the corrosive environment that is your body and also protect your body from these uh, toxic materials that's inside this package. You have your electrodes that sit against the neurons that we just showed. And then uh, between that, you have the cable that connects the electrodes to the electronics. And importantly, for every one electrode that you have, you have one, uh, one, one wire and one connector. So in the case of the devices that are currently available off the shelf, uh, like these shown, they typically have anywhere from about four to 16 electrodes. So that means four to 16 wires that connect to the electronics. So this is a pretty low number, which means they can still be made by hand. And the electrodes are relatively large on the scale of millimeters. These materials uh, haven't really changed much since the 80s, uh, really even earlier than that. And this is partly because they work. Uh, people are able to hear, tremors and pain are reduced. So they've been um, serving the medical community and patients pretty well for a couple of decades now. But uh, how do we go from here, just a, uh, just a few electrodes, to here? And I mean, do we even want to go here? Like some of these things are, are, are the scarier parts of what a neural interface can do. Uh, and I probably need to actually update these examples. If you guys have newer suggestions for neural interfaces that show up in movies, uh, please type them into the chat. I'm also just looking for some good movies um, to watch while st we're still quarantined here in California for the most part. Um, but hopefully you guys recognize some of these. Uh, so I think using neural implants for augmentation, which is just what's depicted in, in most of Hollywood movies is, uh, is super exciting stuff. But personally, uh, for me today, what drives me to improve neurotech is the step that will come before all of this. And that is to uh, help improve the lives of people who are suffering from brain disorders and injury. And both these cases, whether you're working for a medical application or eventually going to augmentation, uh, we there's still, there's whole lot left to do. Um, for one, we still need to learn a lot more about the biology of the brain, some fundamental basic science discoveries. And second, we definitely need, need to upgrade our neural interface technologies. Specifically, we need to figure out how to make these devices smaller, but have more functionalities. So let's talk about how we can do that. So one big leap that was made in this field was the invention of a retinal prosthesis by the company Second Sight. Um, to imagine that it's the late 90s or early 2000s, uh, many of you may not have been born yet, and you're, but you're working in neural prosthetics and someone says, I want a neural implant, but instead of these uh, 10 electrodes or four to 16 electrodes, I want a thousand and I want all of them implanted into the eye. So if you look at the neural prosthesis uh, available then and, and still now, it's immediately obvious that a new technology has to be developed. It, it would never fit and um, you couldn't hand make that many and be repeatable also. So Second Sight started to put together a very large team of universities and government labs to solve this problem. And one of those labs uh, involved was uh, LLNL or Lawrence Livermore National Lab, which is where I did my postdoc and how I got introduced into this field. And before we go into the tech, uh, let's take a step back for a second and look at how the retina works. So your retina is made up of several layers of different kinds of neuron. It kind of reminds me of um, those seven layer uh, taco dips. So first light comes in from the outside world and travels to the back of your retina where there is a layer of rod and cone cells and these are your photoreceptors. These, this triggers the chemical and electrical communication from one layer of neuron to the next until finally the signal goes to your optic nerve then to your visual cortex where it's decoded and you perceive an image. So this is how a normal functioning retina works. But in a disease called retinitis pigmentosa, the rod and cone cells start to die off. 
And uh, even though the rest of the components, the neurons, your optic nerve, your visual cortex are still intact, there's, if there's no layer to translate the photons to electrical signals, then you never perceive an image and you don't have sight. The, the signal never makes it to your brain. And this is where retinal prosthesis comes in. So looking at uh, the layer of neurons here, um, we can tack an electrode array directly to the outer layer of those neurons that are still working. So these are the, still fine, even when these um, have been damaged. And, then, and this is the whole system. So the person wears a pair of glasses with a camera on it that captures an image, for example, the letter E here. The image gets digitized and processed in a processing unit that's worn by the patient on their waist. And uh, the data is then sent wirelessly across the skin. It's not shown here, but there's a there's a antenna on, on the pair of glasses. The data and power is sent wirelessly across the skin to the implant. And in the implant, you have your electronics package, uh, the receiving antenna, and then your electrode array. And those signals um, are then sent to the electrode. Uh, to say which electrodes to stimulate and uh, then stimulates the neurons, the adjacent neurons or nerves so, uh, that are still working. So like the, it's, it's a lot like the cochlear implant. You know, it's, it's kind of one of the reasons I, I mentioned uh, how that works so you could see the parallel in this. In the same way, we're bypassing um, damaged neurons and trying to get closer to where the signals are ultimately interpreted, which is in your brain. A big technological advancement that enabled this breakthrough was the manufacturing of these electrode arrays themselves. Specifically, the breakthrough was using microfabrication to manufacture the electrode arrays from thin film materials. And this was done with the help of the, the Livermore team, those uh, lucky enough to join, on the tail end of this project. So I can't take credit for this work, but um, I got to join at the very end. And, uh, so here's a, the microfab microfabricated part of the device, shown here. The, this version has 240 electrodes, with, which means it has 240 wires, 240 connectors. And it's a thin and flexible um, device that can be molded to be curved along the eye. And the image on the left is a device that's been tacked, on, tacked onto an actual eye. So this couldn't have been done with uh, the standard materials that are used for the current devices for DBS and cochlear. So if these weren't done by hand, how are they made? To manufacture the flexible electrode arrays, uh, we used MEMS microfabrication. So this is a set of techno technologies that was developed from the integrated circuit industry that many of you um, may be familiar with. It's the same silicon-based technologies that were developed to build chips. Um, they were, those uh, processes, these technologies were modified to then build tiny electromechanical systems like those shown here. But um, then we, our team at Livermore and others uh, in the research field took those MEMS technologies and adapted the process to work with biocompatible materials so that we could use them to make neural interfaces. So MEMS itself is complicated, but it can be boiled down to three repeating steps. It's a layer by layer process of these um, same three steps. And here is a cartoon that makes building arrays look deceivingly simple. So you start with the silicon substrate, you have your polymer base that you deposit. Uh, you deposit your metal layer and you pattern it deposit your polymer and you pattern an etch. And then voila, you get your flexible electrode array and then embed the electronics and eventually implant into the body. So there were three repeating steps or deposition, etching and patterning. So I won't say um, too much more about the uh, fundamentals of MEMS in this talk, but this is a whole field that you can get your PhD in and have a career in. So if this sounds interesting to you, I encourage you to look uh, into taking some classes and learning more about MEMS. And it's used not just you know, obviously for neural interfaces, but for many other applications. 
So, but at, but a high level, um, one intuitive way to think about how we get to smaller features is by comparing comparing it to standard um, ways of machining. So you can use a CNC machine to drill or etch a pattern, for example. And the smaller your drill bit, the smaller you can make your feature. You can also use lasers and get them to even smaller features and, and more repeatable patterning. Now in MEMS, we go even smaller and we use light or photolithography as a, as a way to create the patterns. Then we use plasma to etch away any material um, or certain materials one layer at a time. So with MEMS, we can build and remove materials. So deposit and etch materials literally one atomic layer at a time. What allows us to do this are specialized equipment, the same types of equipment used to make the, as I mentioned, the chips in your phone. These tools can be uh, quite expensive, several millions of dollars for one tool in some cases. Um, they're not like standard machining tools that can be easily found on eBay or uh, at a machine shop. So besides the equipment, the facility is also uh, specially built. Clean rooms are designed with strict environmental controls. The temperature and humidity variations can cause materials to expand and and contract and uh, even, but when, you know, when you're talking about scales of micro and nanometers, even a 10% expansion can put you out of spec and just mess up your whole process. This layer by layer, you ruin one layer, you, you've um, lost your whole wafer. And particle control is extremely important. That's why it's called a clean room. So people wear these, these um, outfits called bunny suits, not just to protect themselves from chemicals, but mainly to protect the devices from stuff that fall off our bodies all the time. So it's kind of, kind of gross to think about it, but you and I, everyone, we're constantly shedding. We're shedding hair and shedding exfoliating skin. But cleanliness is very important to microfabrication yield. So uh, on the left, we have a silicon wafer uh, with multiple devices. And on the right, one of those devices have been released. That's the 240. Um, electro device with where you have 240 wires that are sitting just on a five millimeter span. So no, so you can imagine that um, if one eyelash fell on that device, if you weren't wearing your goggles, it would be unusable. Like it would cut multiple uh, electrodes at once or cut multiple wires at once and your yield would take a hit. Now ima imagine if you sneezed on a wafer because you weren't wearing a mask, uh, then you've lost the entire wafer in weeks and weeks of work and, and lots of, um, funding that was used to make the device. So even though microfabrication has a lot of benefits for the field in practice, it's difficult and it, it's a difficult and expensive process, which is not yet, yet widely available for medical device manufacturing. But I hope one day it will be because this is um, how we get from you know, 80s technologies to uh, taking a leap in, in neural prosthetics and neural prostheses. So we've discussed um, how some neural implants work and one manufacturing technique that we can use to miniaturize them. Uh, now we can talk about where the neural engineering field is going and why miniaturization is playing such a big role. You know, why is it worth putting the effort into this more complicated process, more expensive process? So I showed you, uh, so one way to miniaturize implant, but besides um, for retinal prosthesis, you know, why do we care? And again, why is this, why is there this trend in academia and even in startups like Paradromics and Neuralink toward making neural implants smaller and having more electrodes? So in the next few slides, I'll showcase a few examples of how miniaturization can make a difference. For the first example, so what happens when we reduce the size of just one dimension, the thickness of a surface array? And surface arrays are electrode arrays that are placed on top of the brain, typically, um, so under the skull, directly on the brain. And it's typically used for monitoring epilepsy. If we, if we were to compare the different technologies, the ones that are commercially available now that can be bought and are used um, in, by surgeons, have been used for many years, you compare that to a thin film technology uh, that's about to become commercial, that's starting to come out from startups. 
Now, and then further compare that to thin film technologies that are even further away from commercial use, the ones that are being used in academia. What you'll see is that with each of these generations that are coming up, the surface arrays are getting um, on average 10 times thinner. So going from millimeters to less than 10 microns at, at some of these university R&D devices. And why does this matter? So here's uh, some data from a startup called NeuroOne. And full disclosure, I'm a consultant for them. They're about to launch uh, the first thin film ECOG or surface arrays. This is what I labeled in the previous slide as a com commercial soon. You know, it's, very, it's coming out very soon. So here they're comparing their device with a standard silicone device. And uh, the ray was implanted in a pig for a week. And the takeaway here is that there was significantly more hemorrhaging under the standard silicone strip as compared to the thin film strip. So in figure A on the left, you have um, the dura is still in place and the electrodes are sitting directly on the brain under the dura. In figure B, the, they peeled back the dura so you could see the electrodes and then see they, they moved the arrays to the side so that you can see the brain um, that was underneath it with the, with the hemorrhaging. If you're trying to figure out what you're looking at here. And uh, here's some staining that was done from tissue staining done from the same study. Uh, the takeaway is that it shows less of an immune response by tissue under the thin film as compared to the standard silicone. So what this study suggests is that one possible benefit from thinner and lighter films could be better clinical outcomes and better patient recovery. And they're continuing to do more work and are, have started to collect some human data with, with these devices. So another reason you mm -hmm. might want to make your electrodes smaller so that you can put many more in many parts of the brain. For example, if you wanted to uh, create a therapy for memory loss, you, you may need to target multiple regions of the brain that are involved in different types of memory or even the same types of memory but uh, more electrode also means more damage. So you want, you want to make them as small as possible. Microfabricated uh, thin film probes can help here too. So in collaboration with UCSF, uh, we made, a, while I was at Livermore, we made a thousand channel polymer probe that could record individual neurons from all over the rat's brain in order to study the memory circuit. Rat brains are much smaller than human brains and you still had to fit a thousand in there. So this would have been impossible with standard manufacturing and standard materials. And the, what I'm showing here is just an illustration of the concept we had the flex, with the flexible arrays and there were, um, that could be implanted in multiple regions simultane simultaneously. And we also had to develop other technolog technologies uh, that were related to the head stage and implantation. You know, when you have, when you're making something that hasn't been done before, you also have to work out the back end and other components, including, as I said, the method of surgery. And that was done by the great group at UCSF. And here are real images to show that you, we actually made it, made the real thing, brought this concept to reality thanks to an NIH Brain Initiative grant. grant. And you can see on the left, the uh, flexible cables that are coming out of the rat. So that's part of the uh, thin film polymer probes. And one of the benefits of that, the ability to, to flex like that, as opposed to uh, silicon, which is also commonly used in this field. And you can read about uh, the more, most exciting parts of this is the, the neuroscience that can be done. You can read about that in the results from the papers that came out of the Lauren Frank lab. As I said, they're a really great group. So the third example of why we want to make smaller devices with more electrodes is we want to make smarter deep, deep brain stimulation devices. So for a long time, DBS devices had one mode of operation. They're always on, always stimming, and at one frequency. But uh, what clinicians want is to be able to monitor brain activity and use those recordings to adjust the stimulation therapy. The more places we can record from and the better we can control the, uh, the brain region that we're stimulating, then the more new and effective therapies that could be discovered 
with DBS. So that means like if we can make the electrodes smaller so that we can target more specific regions and we can make them less, um, make the, the surgical risk lower, we can expand the different applications for DBS. So a few years ago, the DARPA Brain Initiative uh, funded several programs to develop closed loop DBS therapies for uh, on these, th these two projects was to restore memory and subnets was for addressing psychiatric diseases. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, right now DBS is um, FDA approved mainly for movement disorder disorders. Uh, though in uh, the research world, clinical world, it's being used for other, we're, we're testing it out in other applications like those that I just named, OCD and Alzheimer's. So our group was uh, at Livermore is very fortunate enough to be part of this, the first awards that came out of this program and got to work with um, uh, several collaborators. As you can imagine, creating a BCI is really complex and you need, it really takes a village to make these devices and the whole, the whole therapy, it's not just about the device. So at Livermore, we demonstrated that we can use thin film microfabrication to, um, to make the DBS probes and surface arrays with more electrodes, but without increasing the overall size of the implant. So that's important. So in the image on the left, we sh I'm showing a device that has, um, we made anywhere from 16 to 64 electrodes uh, in the same size that a commercial device only has four. And on the right, if you look at the upper right corner with the green and red, red dots, that illustrates that we're able to fit many more of the red Livermore electrodes in the same space as the standard electrodes uh, on a standard device that are depicted in green. So this is a step toward a platform technology for closed loop DBS that could be customized for different brain regions and different diseases. When I went to Neuralink, uh, we took miniaturization even a step further. We made the electrodes even smaller, um, so small that we had to build a robot to insert the devices because we also wanted to insert thousands of them. So the idea is that uh, we need to get more and more information in and out of the brain such that eventually uh, we can kind of become one, the brain and the machine. I guess that's the simplest way to explain it. Um, but on the way to that goal, we wanted to help people who are paralyzed from the neck down to gain some independence by helping them control a computer cursor with their mind. So um, that, that really adds a lot to a person's life in terms of being able to uh, communicate with others, send texts, you know, maybe even order your own food. Um, and uh, so there's, there are technologies now that are doing this, again, in the, the research world. And the idea and thought is that if we can uh, put in more electrodes and get to, uh, again, it's all about the spatial resolution, trying to get to more targeted regions and get more information, we'll get better at decoding what the brain is trying to say and decoding the intent of um, what people are thinking, what they want to do. So uh, this is my last example of how miniaturizing neural implants are necessary for advancing medical treatments. Okay. I've mostly been focusing on the electrode arrays and wires so far, but it's also necessary to miniaturize the electronics and the packaging. Uh, there are, these are some of the technically, actually the most technically challenging areas in my opinion, that we're facing in uh, neural engineering these days, particularly, specifically in the hardware development. I call this my floating finger slide. Everyone seems to like uh, to show the scale of packages with, with our fingers. Uh, and these are different projects that uh, the teams I've worked on uh, have developed. And here we have uh, the latest, which is the, uh, at, at Neuralink we iterate so fast that this is already, um, probably old news, but this is a thousand channel electronics uh, implant uh, package that's hermetically sealed and you would have the electrode array that connects to that. This one uh, was developed on the upper right for the retinal implant. So this is about 13 millimeters across for 60 electrodes up to 240. We were able to fit in there. And then the bottom 
was designed for a DBS implant. And this something to note is you design these with the surgery in mind. So the, this rounded um, shape with the soft curves, remember was implanted in the eye. And in this case, um, it had to fit through the cannula that you're using for the DBS implant. That's why it has this oval shape to it. So this is, um, well, and this is a standard package that uh, standard meaning on these devices that are commercially available now that I've shown earlier. So uh, people don't take uh, floating finger photos with these because they're too big. So I had to use a banana for scale, but you can quickly see the dramatic size difference. Uh, this is um, I'm kind of cheating here because the device is includes the battery in here in this example, whereas the ones in the previous um, slide don't. But uh, I think it gets the message across that we, as we go to these higher electrode numbers, we, we have to also develop the electronics that can handle that much data, and then also develop the hermetic packages and connectors to house and connect the system. So though electrode arrays get the most attention in this field, including by me, I'm mostly usually give talks about the arrays, the electronics and packaging are just as critical and in need of development. And I really hope you know, more people get into trying to solve some of these problems and on these components. So earlier I asked, how do, we, how, do, how do we get from these large 10 electrode neural implants we've been using for decades to a place where we are interfacing with our brain seamlessly like, like in the movies? And here I'm showing an off the shelf um, DBS electrode with four channels in, in the top. And below it is uh, a prototype from Neuralink with a thousand channels where you can't even see the electrodes. So the electrodes are actually hanging off the side here. And this is where the robot will pick it up and implant. And each of these hold multiple uh, electrode wires, each of these cables. Um, so, so this is my answer. We get there by uh, a step-by-step -step process, by improving technologies and developing neural interfaces that are seemingly invisible, not just to the eye, but also to the brain. Can we make them small? these devices um, that you're implanting small enough and biocompatible such that the brain doesn't even know it's there? So I don't even talk about this whole other side of things where you're trying to avoid um, uh, the foreign body response. And with the idea of as you make the devices smaller, um, the, it, essentially the brain will not respond to it because it doesn't really see it, as long as your material also is uh, biocompatible. That's also for another talk. So at this point, I've showed you some ways to miniaturize neural implants um, and, and how that could help to improve the lives of patients. And it may seem like we're really close to having these types of devices become standard medical practice, but we're really not. I, sure, we're closer than ever before, so this is great, um, uh, but I'm impatient, and so I feel like we're not moving fast enough. There's still a lot of work and a lot of progress um, uh, being made in an R&D, which is great, but very few of these um, technologies, devices, uh, make it to the clinic, much less to a commercial product. I mean, neural engineering is still a fairly new field, and that's a big reason, and the best is yet to come. And to get there, we need the help of many people like um, you guys to help us bridge this gap. So what, what are some of these problems? Why can't we get some of these, more of these technologies out of the bench top and into the clinic? So besides the hard materials, electrical and mechanical engineering problems that um, have yet to be solved. There are also other challenges in taking a technology from a concept to viable clinical therapy. And most of these things, um, they don't teach you in school. Like mainly the challenges that are associated with manufacturing, production costs, and regula regulatory compliance. Uh, this is also another topic <laughs> or a topic for a whole other discussion, but I wanted to plant the seed in your heads now so that if you decide to get into this field, um, Maybe you can start to learn about these issues a little earlier and help us to improve the pipeline from R&D to commercialization. And also if some of you may be more interested in these other topics and didn't realize that your engineering background could play a role or that there's a part in these that could play a role in say, for example, ethics or regulations or, or the business case. 
and also um, the number of startups in neurotech have really exploded in the last few years. And these are really important concepts uh, to know about and to progress. But from a technical standpoint on hardware, in my opinion, the, the biggest technical challenges, as I mentioned, miniaturizing the hermetic uh, packages and connectors, the electronics themselves, making them more or less and low power. And then uh, in terms of thin film technologies, because they're thin, they can, they're more fragile. So working on making the materials more robust and reliable. And part of the reason that there is a gap from this R&D to clinical um, it can be hard, why that's so hard to cross is that the driving forces between the two are um, sometimes the opposite of each other. So in basic research, the key is to do something novel be the first to achieve something, show that something is feasible. But when you're trying to commercialize a clinical product, you need to lower the risk and uh, the risk benefit ratio. And that's the most important factor. So the more boring the device, the more times um, it's been done before, then the lower the risk. And uh, so this is, again, when we're in school, we're taught more of the stuff on the left side, but it's also a science in itself, an engineering feat in itself to make something really reliable. And oftentimes, so the teams that work on these end up being completely different teams. So if you decide to, if you do decide to work uh, in this translational space between R&D and commercial product or clinical, I, uh, I have some lessons I'd like to share in when engineering a device going from um, academic from an academic exercise to a product. And I'll just highlight three. There's like all, probably a hundred different lessons um, learned over the years. And uh, I'll just read through these three in the interest of time, but we can expand on them if you'd like uh, during the lunch hour. Um, so the first is don't build the perfect uh, device, build the necessary first. As engineers, we tend to over-engineer and that um, will, in the scenario where you're trying to make a product that can cause a lot of delays uh, unnecessarily in the beginning when, especially at a startup, when you don't have a lot of money and you need to, something that just works. Second is, um, I think this is my biggest pet peeve, is uh, don't build without getting input from your user. If you do, if you're making something because you think it's cool, uh, and maybe you did make something cool, but no one's gonna to wanna to use it. It's just gonna sit on the shelf. So you need to talk to your stakeholders and people who will be using your device in the way that you intend them to use it from the very beginning, from the time you're designing, while you're developing, through the whole process. And uh, lastly, this is something you know, I didn't really think about or realize too much either while I was in school, but it's, or it's counterintuitive. It's easy to make something once, but it's much harder to make a process reliable. So if you end up being, again, I keep using startup as an example, and you, have, and you end up being the person who's in charge of the project timeline, remember that however long it took you to get to that first prototype, it's gonna take you even longer to create a manufacturing process to make that uh, process reliable. I find that in uh, new engineers, they think it's the opposite. They think, oh, once, once I get this prototype, the rest will be easy but that's actually the other way around. So I hope you guys learned at least one thing new in the past uh, hour or so, and uh, hopefully you feel like you have a better understanding of why there's a trend in neural engineering to make smaller and more functional devices. The key takes away, takeaways are that neural implants are undergoing a miniaturization evolution. Thin film fabrication is one way to miniaturize these devices. Smaller and more functional neural interfaces can lead to lower clinical risks and more therapies. That's really why we're doing this. And that there are a lot of problems left that we could really use help on. So hopefully you guys jump on board. And as always, a big shout out to my former teammates, including uh, collaborators that are not shown here. I, they uh, really made working in this field fun and very rewarding. And thank you for your time and looking forward to the questions and discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Tolosa. Delighted, it was a wonderful talk. And uh, you spanned some history to where we are now, but most importantly, telling the 
students that it's not just building the technology, but it's actually engineering it. And by what I mean by engineering it is exactly what you said to be actually be able to put it in manufacture and, and put it into use. And so it is, it is much more than concept to that. I'm really, um, really happy to note that uh, part of our program for especially the undergraduates, uh, their senior design is very quite rigorous. All the teams do BHF and BMRs for their mm -hmm. prototypes. They must understand where their system fits. And it's not just an ideation thing. They actually build the prototype and learn the process. So at least they are, uh, they are getting uh, quite exposed to the regulatory pathway yeah, and are yeah. thinking about it. So, and, and not just thinking about it, but actually saying, how do I apply that here? And what are the standards that have to be applied? So I'm, uh, it, your, your talk brings that uh, very much to the forefront. That's will, great. You're putting them ahead of the game. <laughs> we hope so, we hope yeah. so. Um, uh, and uh, then I have, I'm going to ask you some of the questions that came up in the, in the Q&A and people please start putting the Q&A questions. So one person talked about neural dust and wanted to know these are nano sized nerve sensors that radio signal, do these have potential? I, I think you can answer that more with one of the uh, other speakers. I think it was from the last last Maharvi. fall, Dr. Yeah. Michelle Maharvey. He's like, he talks about the neural, and I actually mentioned in one of my slides that you should look at his intro because it's a great intro for mine too. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd point you to, to his talk and you can talk, you, you learn more about the uh, limitations and the possibilities. But I, I think in principle, yeah, like he they show that it's possible that there, there's nothing um, limiting, at least in the laws of physics, limiting this from becoming a possibility. The challenge is in most cases with brand new um, technologies is taking that from that step to something, as I mentioned, reliable and manufacturable. But in theory, it, it it's possible. Um, could be used. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Santiago Fossi wants to know, are the wires used in retinal implants the longest wires used in neural implants? And does this cause it to be the most invasive surgery to be implanted? Uh, the, what, it, compared to, so for the retinal implant, they're not, they're not that long, actually. They only span a few, maybe a couple centimeters in the eye because you're only covering the eye, whereas the so short answer is no, they're, they're not the longest, the and not most invasive. It's also going into the eye, which your eye turns out is like 98% water. Compare that to um, brain implants, brain technologies. They have to be longer, they're, especially if you're trying to reach a deeper target, it could be 10 centimeters deep. And, uh, and those are obviously more invasive. You're going through the skull, to the, through the brain. I don't know if I understood the question correctly, but I hope no, I think that that's true. Okay. And then if you think about the spinal cord stimulator, right. as you mentioned, those are even longer wire, yeah. wires that are there, much, much longer wires. Right. Yeah. Which we don't so, use thin film for, for that yes. reason. So, mm -hmm. there, yeah. um, Sophia Belena wants to know, are there other miniaturized neural implants that serve to restore other sensors besides sight? For example, stimulation of the olfactory nerve. Mm -hmm. Not commercially, as far as I know. But in R and D, I mean, basically all the examples I showed you that cover DPS. That uh, we we. So when I was at, at Livermore, I, we took this. When I joined, as I said, we were ending the retinal prosthesis, but we have this platform technology, which are flexible polymer probes. And one of my jobs was then to go around looking for new uses, new applications for this. And what we could, basically what we could do is we could make devices um, for any type of animal model from mice to humans, uh, spinal cord, auditory nerve for hearing, um, visual cortex, like so directly visual cortex for, for sight, uh, deep brain targets, or I showed you memory was one of them. So really depending on where you're implanting it, you can use a customized version of this technology and uh, affect different brain disorders. All of this mostly is in research, which is why I'm like pushing for like, can we get this into therapies? But commercially using thin film, uh, the retinal prosthesis 
and maybe a, there's a couple more new ones out there um, that are just starting to get a CE mark, which is the um, Europe's FDA approval process um, that are coming out. Uh, Dr. Raj asks, what are prevalent thin film metal slash dye electrode? Uh, 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 I think Orlando maybe moved some things up there. Okay, what are prevalent thin film metal dye electrode, electrode systems? What are emerging and high risk and emerging and promising? Yeah, that's a whole field I, I didn't talk about our failures, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. How do things fail? And material selection is very important when you're implanting into the brain. In terms, for example, for the metals, you're really limited. In both cases, you're limited because it has to um, it has to be compatible with the body, and then it has to last many years. In this, your your body, it turns out, is actually really um, hostile environment. You have chemicals that are constantly attacking whatever you're putting in in there that doesn't belong there. It's at a raised temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. And so for the, one of the requirements for the metal or that we like to use are noble metals, like platinum, uh, iridium, gold, and happen to be the most expensive metals also. And then for dielectrics, I mean, the ones I typically work with are polymers, but um, in, in the research setting, you can use oxides and nitrides. I, emerging, um, so even though like the, the ones I just named are commonly used in R&D, again, like I keep, I sound like a broken record, they don't yet exist really in the uh, commercial world. So we still need to uh, make them prevalent in the commercial world before, not, e not even before, um, while also coming up with new materials. So emerging, the one that a lot of people are starting to talk about now, and is also one of my, well, for the last few years, but becoming more popular, um, and is also one of my favorites is silicon carbide. It's uh, chemically resistant um, and biocompatible, it has a lot of uh, uh, properties depending on how you tune it. But I, again, like the problem with all of these is um, how do we make them reliable and manufacturable? Then uh, Nicholas Buitrago asks, do you see the rate of innovation in the field of neural engineering and more specifically microfabrication accelerating significantly in the near future? Uh, I think, yeah, in some aspects, yes, because there are, if I haven't done this, but if you made a list together of how many neural engineering labs there were 10 years ago, and then five years and now, it's probably exponential. Right? So as we get more people involved, this is why I'm excited about this field becoming more popular. And one of the great things that happened with Neuralink, with um, Elon getting involved, is that it's become um, almost like common knowledge that these things exist. And this is very recent. When I first started, like no one even understood that brain implants already existed. You know, deep brain devices have been around since the 80s. So as we get more people excited, as we get more funding from um, NIH and DARPA and the government, and also from VCs, that allows more research to open up and more progress on the material science and engineering that needs to happen. So yes, I, I do see acceleration um, in, uh, in this field. I will um, uh, ask a related question that Zach Danziger asked, what is the market for all these neurotechnology startups? Who are they selling to? Or are these companies mostly grant funded at the moment? There is, a, as I mentioned, a lot of excitement in the last few years um, in VCs. Okay, so the funding traditionally and, con and continues to be, you know, government funding does exist, like NIH and DARPA are great uh, supporters. And then more recently, uh, as I mentioned, you know, Elon put in $100 million to kick off Neuralink. There's Kernel that also uh, started to get in this field. And more, more of the commercial side is on the non-invasive. So there's a lot more money there. It's closer to getting to commercials, a, bit, a bigger market that you can get to. I, I don't have the actual like billions or trillions of dollars of the market in my head right now that there's um, lots of reports out. You can look at neurotech reports 
that uh, come out with pretty updated numbers on the market. But where the funding sources are coming, uh, I'm excited to see that it's starting to come from other areas outside of government, as I said, from uh, business people who are excited about this field. I'm not sure how long that will last, so get in there now if you want to do a startup. I think we are just at the beginning, but um, yeah, the more people that can get on the commercial side, I think the better. For the students who are listening, Kernel is a Google company, a Google parent company related to oh, the Google it? guy. Yeah. So, it's a Brian Johnson of, company. I didn't realize it was a... Maybe I'm mixing it up. With, not, not verily. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm mixing <laughs> it up. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, one other, Mario, who Yamwe asked, have you considered the applications of this in regards to prosthetics? And I yes. think it probably means <laughs> other prosthetics. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I didn't talk about... Um, using the, the implant, what, you know, I talked about cursor control, using it to con control the cursor in your computer, but it, the same idea could be to control a robotic arm. So that work, a lot of that work by uh, BrainGate project, Brain, Brain project, if you wanna look that up, has been done and definitely a lot more work needs to be done. One of the most exciting, I think, areas is not just controlling a robotic arm, but uh, sensory feedback. So which you guys may know about, but that to me is one of the most exciting parts, one of the hardest things to do. And, and um, it really makes, a, to me, or from what I've heard, makes a person feel whole. Like it's one thing to use a tool to move something, but then it's another to feel a sensation again once you've lost it. Uh, so that's something to look out for. Um, I see another question from Nicolas. Kutarago, do you see this technology becoming more accessible to those outside of well-funded labs for hobbies or those that want to develop prototypes for their own ideas? Yes, so there's a lot of um, student groups uh, now that have come up again that weren't around when I started. There's, uh, they're not off the top of my head, but OpenBCI is something you, you can look up, uh, Neurotech X, is um, have multiple chapters in different cities and they are helping to make neurotech accessible to even like high school and younger. There's, um, yeah, there's a lot out there. Like I, maybe I could send uh, some out later after I look, look up, but yeah, it, it's an exciting, I'm excited by the, the question. I haven't been asked, but just thinking about it uh, we're, we're, I'm realizing like these things didn't exist before and I hope more people learn about it and at a younger age and get involved. Yes, um, uh, that, that, that would be great. Thank you so much for offering to send us that information. And just for the students who are listening, we here in BME itself uh, are doing stuff with neural devices and BCI, Dr. Danziger's lab does BCI work and also neuroprosthesis for bladder control stuff and my own lab, the Jung lab, we do uh, things with the neurostimulation for sensory feedback uh, uh, aspects. Mm -hmm. So somebody asked also about other sensory modalities. And so this is a sensory modality for the touch or grasp work. So we are also doing that. And we are getting uh, some advice and input from Dr. Tolosa also. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, Dr. Raj asks, can you provide quantitative electrical performance metrics for electrodes such as impedance time area current injection targets? Maybe this is an answer to be given later in detail, but perhaps you can uh, talk about the importance of these things. Yeah, and the relationship to um, size of electrodes. So this becomes important, this idea of charge injection, how much charge you can, um, use to stimulate a neuron with your electrodes. There's a couple of aspects to that, safety aspects. You have to think about the safety of the tissue and then also the safety of the material, your electrode material. So when we're designing these electrodes, as we get smaller, what you, the, the challenge for me when I work on the electrodes part is because you're going smaller, your current density increases and um, to be able to stimulate, to, there's a certain threshold that you need to stimu stimulate neurons. So as you go smaller, that density tends to get higher. And uh, with the density going higher, you can start to damage your electrode before 
you reach the threshold that you need to stimulate your neurons. So a lot of the development um, on the engineering side is how do we get material, electrode materials that can withstand higher charge densities because so many people want to go smaller and smaller down to the size of neurons. And, and just a quick one way to do that is you increase the effective surface area. So you can keep the geometric area the same, but effectively, if you put, for example, um, rough increase the surface area roughness, then your uh, effective surface area increases. That's just one way to do it. Uh, but yeah, this is a huge, um, it, it can become a limiting factor in, in miniaturizing electrodes. This also answers Satya Kumar's question. Can you share your thoughts on miniaturization challenges related to electrode material and charge delivery for stimulation? We are past our 10 o'clock, but there are a few more questions. So I think I will just ask you those. Uh, questions uh, so that we can cover those because of the, it, it, this exciting input from others. Nelson Abarka has asked, any thoughts on DBS devices stimulating non-neuronal cells? Could this better modulate therapies? Um, DBS devices stimulating non-neuronal non cells. cells. Like meaning for not, so not a non-neural applications like maybe or glia maybe is she and, i'm or, not sure she's thinking oh i see that. i'm not sure what she's talking about. okay uh, so i'm i'm not glia. sure maybe yes I'm not... she says she's asking okay. glia she's saying glia okay yeah i'm i'm going to defer to neuroscientists on this question <laughs> okay <laughs> on the All different right. types so, of cells that can be stimulated yeah pro uh, yeah now nelson we definitely that's a discussion and perhaps also to talk with dr riera about it who does of uh, EG and a bunch of real work. So uh, then uh, I have a question from Claudia Paredes. What are some companies or research institutions where retinite, retinitis pigmentosa is being studied, treated through engineering? Um, there are, there's a couple, couple of ways to treat, um, different retinal disorders. So there's the neural prosthesis way, and there are a few in the pipeline that are in like CE mark or um, going through FDA approval besides second site. There's also, and like, off, I don't have the names off the top of my head, like, and some of them, I'm probably behind on some of the companies. I don't know if they still exist. I, I don't wanna say a company and then find out that they actually don't exist anymore. But another uh, thing that people are doing is genetic engineering for uh, some of these retinal um, issues. So that's something that I didn't talk about, but uh, for, for some diseases, I wonder if genetic engineering, you know, with the rise, especially with CRISPR, I wonder if it's gonna make the need for neural prosthetics um, moot in some year. I, I hope so, you know, the more therapies, the better. But um, yeah, I encourage, if you're interested in, um, uh, the retina, there's technologies on both ends, no prosthesis and genetic engineering. I'm sorry, there I'm not two, naming the companies, but you, you can look at them up. There are two technology questions. Alejandro Giarte asks, what are the capabilities of 3D printing electronics for mini implants? Yeah, um, that's, all, that's also an exciting area that uh, several groups are looking at. There's there's so many components that you need. I mean, I talked about electrodes and I just generally talked about um, electronics and packaging, but you dive, if you dive deeper and break an electronic package down, there are many parts. There's the feed-through substrate, there's the, the can, and then how do you assemble them and the parts that go inside. So there are opportunities um, for 3D printing. One, one thing that pops in my head that uh, I, thought about before is the interconnect. So bonding, so you have a thousand electrodes and you have to bond it to the electronics package. Well, if you need it to be very small, so how do you, so that means your interconnects are like 10 microns, 50 microns, and there's really not a lot of good technology out there for that, but what, maybe that's one area someone can 3D print um, bond pads. But uh, there's, so I guess the short answer, there's, there's a place for it. A lot of it is still an R&D stage, very academic, and uh, hopefully that gets... Uh, Andres Pena asks, implanting 1024 channels is cool and all, but that's a lot of data and or stimulation options. Can you comment or give an example on the use of AI 
to make sense of all of it, especially for closed loop therapies. Yeah, and that's um, that's a whole other field that uh, people like don't realize. And I've had a couple of um, students contact me who had computer science background, who heard about BCI and wanted to know if there's anything um, they can do to help in the field. And I always tell them, oh yeah, the data science, like there's like that, that's, uh, there's a need for it. And also um, one, one thing to point out why that's really important is we have uh, clinicians who we, you can, people go to and say, okay, for example, spinal cord, what if we gave you a hundred electrodes? Um, they're actually even DBS they are turned off because what they'll tell you is, well, I wouldn't know what to do with all those parameters. Now, now you've just given me uh, so many more combinations of stimulation between uh, electrodes. Like they barely know what to do with 32. So if you give me a hundred, you've exploded the number of stim parameters that they have to work through to see which therapy would work. So they're all, they, they'll turn it down. They'd rather like stick to the lower number. But if we um, can, develop that further for them, have some kind of automated process that helps, um, which is where closed loop helps, where we're recording the uh, data and then decoding it and optimizing um, automatically the proper therapy, proper STEM. Basically what I'm saying, if you can make it as easy as possible for the, the clinicians, the more likely your product is gonna get adopted. So there's dev definitely a, lot, a huge need in that area of what do you do with all this data and then how do you uh, use it to then make better therapies? Okay. I think um, there are, uh, there are, uh, there's one other question which I think is just related when maybe time is tight is, uh, is limit seems to be 10, 24 electrodes. What is the biggest challenge to overcome this? It's and, not the limit. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. It, it's not the, the limit, it's a, it was, it's a nice um, module to use. Uh, it's one of the modules we used at Neuralink, but you know, we had a 3000 channel module also that was on the bioarchive paper that came out. Um, really, in, in some ways, when you say limit, there's like different ways to answer this, but the one that um, I'm harping on a lot is on the connectors. <laughs> so sometimes the answer is actually the limit is 24 not even a thousand, forget a thousand. We can't get 24 um, electrodes on an, an implant for commercial use because the current uh, connectors that are um, hermetically sealed that you can plug in hermetically seal are too big. Anything more than 16 or 24, you, uh, you can't fit in the brain. So um, this is a, ma a, a major blockage in why we're not seeing higher channel counts in, in devices now that are being sold. And this so is I the last, mm -hmm. the last question for you is, has there been, Camila Padilla asks, has there been any sort of neurotechnology research centered on Alzheimer's, dementia, et cetera, even epilepsy, which I think you answered before, but it's- there is, Yeah, there are. And I think just, um, there are a few now, like, there's one that just a few weeks ago, I think functional neuromodulation announced some funding and they are specifically on Alzheimer's. Um, it's not Alzheimer's, it's memory, but neotherapeutics that came out of the RAM project is working in that field. And they are aware of a couple of startups that are still in stealth mode that are starting to address that with neural uh, implants. So with that, we have uh, crossed over the time and thank you very much for this uh, fantastic talk and then all these questions that the students have asked and the broad range of and faculty have asked the broad range. I encourage the students uh, to join uh, the, you know, the graduate students to join you for the lunch hour where you can ask Dr. Tolosa questions other than technology questions of how is it that she has move from uh, in such a short while through this whole process of uh, this ecosystem of, of, of technology development and in different uh, areas, including working at a national lab. So she brings this experience of being in a, in a big, in a startup company, while Elon Musk startup company mm -hmm. and uh, directing that the national labs. 
starting her own effort now and uh, so ask her questions in general too.